Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Uh, welcome to this talk, uh, Real World Hypermedia at NRK TV. Uh, my name is Aina. Uh, well, uh, claiming to sort of be talking about the real world is kind of a tall order, but uh, we'll see. Um, I work as a backend developer, uh, software designer, I suppose, uh, at uh, NRK TV, which is, uh, well, NRK is the public uh, national broadcaster in Norway. NRK TV is our TV streaming service. Uh, we, uh, well, in a sort of gross simplification of numbers, uh, you could say that we have roughly half a million users every day uh, consuming roughly half a million hours of content. And, uh, well, sort of the exact numbers you can probably debate. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is to sort of give a backdrop for, uh, to convince you that we basically need to stay up all the time. Um, now, why are we introducing hypermedia in uh, NRK TV? which is a good question, I suppose. Is it because it's in vogue? Is it fashionable? Well, it isn't, so, so, so that can't be it. And is it because I personally like it? Well, I do, but uh, since we're talking about the real world, that doesn't really matter. So that matters for a hobby project. Uh, but we do it because we think it helps us. And in particular, it helps us with architecture. So I want to discuss in this talk hypermedia as an enabler for software, better software architecture. So this is an architecture talk. Uh, hope that's not too disappointing. I mean, it has to do with the real world, so then it sort of architecture tends to creep in. Um, in fact, uh, an alternative title to this talk, I suppose, could be strangling the monolith with hypermedia. So that's what we're trying to do, I suppose, in. Uh, in one perspective, at least, at NRK TV. So the agenda for the talk is to start by talking about some architectural challenges that we've faced at NRK TV. Then I'll do a short introduction to hypermedia. I'll show some hypermedia examples in practice that we, some strategies that we use at NRK TV. And I hope that by the end of the talk, I will have convinced you that hypermedia is really about architecture. So it's not just some sort of neat theoretical idea, it's a useful architectural instrument that you can use to improve the architecture in your system. Okay, so I'm gonna start with these architecture concerns. And sort of in the real world, uh, software happens in what you could call a socio-technical context. So we sort of have to start with that. In fact, I'd like to start with sort of a business perspective uh, for uh, um, making the NRK TV service. So we're working in a domain that's rapidly evolving. Competition is getting more and more fierce, not just nationally, uh, but internationally as well. So we do have to stay competitive. We do have to stay relevant, and for, to do that, we must be nimble. In terms of organization, we have multiple teams doing different kinds of stuff at NRK TV itself. We collaborate with uh, NRK Radio and also NRK Super, which is uh, our offering for children. And of course, we have lots of interactions with other parts of the organization as well, in particular planning systems, uh, production systems, stuff like that. But um, even though this is a real world talk, I'm sort of going to pretend that's not part of the picture because the real world is just too big. I'm going to simplify the real world a little bit and pretend that NRK TV lives in a vacuum. We are a system inside a system of systems, but we're sort of going to talk just about our subsystem. And even within that subsystem, we must support autonomy. We must support experiments. We must support change. And at the same time, we should provide a uh, high level of stability as well, because we have these half a million users uh, every day, and they get angry if we don't work. Uh, from a technical perspective, what I'm going to talk about is the stuff that I'm working on, which is sort of simplified to just uh, the sort of player API for the TV service. We serve uh, content to a lot of different kinds of clients. That would be your uh, 
your web browser, your smart TV, your mobile phone, whatever you use to uh, watch TV content from Mara Kay, uh, that's what we serve data to. And you can sort of roughly, I guess, uh, group those into progressive clients, like uh, our uh, web client that would deploy basically every day, and more like legacy clients, uh, for instance, for an old, older kind of smart TV and stuff like that. And then you see uh, quickly that these social technical factors uh, come into picture again, because okay, maybe these uh, deploy four times a year, which is kind of different from these progressive clients. And we need to support both. And this has an impact on architecture as well. So for this talk, I would like to go roughly three years back in time and introduce the monolith. So we had our monolithic player API, which is a web API serving all these kinds of different kinds of clients. It's running on Azure on two data centers. It's backed by a relational database. It has a bunch of supporting worker jobs, and it employs some cunning caching schemes uh, to make it perform reasonably well. So that's all well and good. It's working. It doesn't have too much downtime. But the complexity is sort of overwhelming. So it's, uh, it's uh, not a pleasant uh, thing to get into as a new developer. It is largely unreasonable in two senses of the word, both literally and in the sense that you're not really able to reason about it. It has complex failure modes. Uh, effects of change are hard to predict. There are obviously bugs then. And then you get scared of changing, and then you stagnate, and you're not nimble, which is a problem. And we basically, we still manage to deploy quite often because we have this uh, release manager who is sort of uh, has these six senses of what you can release at the same time. So we, maybe uh, we had a schedule like once a week or something, we could deploy stuff. Um, but that's, that's not a good situation to be in. So what to do? Should we rewrite this API? What do you mean rewrite? We cannot rewrite. We have half a million users every day. So we can't possibly rewrite. So how do we rewrite? We still have the same problem. We need to rewrite the thing, and we can't rewrite the thing. So we must evolve instead. So we need to evolve into a better place than when we are, where we are at the time and still managing to stay up. Uh, but it's a good thing, uh, place, I think, to sort of pause and try to think about where did, this, where did this monolith come from anyway? Why did, it, why did it arise? Why do we have this problem? How did we get there? And I'm going to try sort of a thought leader answer to that. I'm going to say it's the entity's fault. And I'm going to say that the entity is the monolith itself. Because the entity is what snowballs complexity. The entity is the big ball of mud. Now, what is the entity? For NRK TV, the entity is the TV show. Now, this sounds a bit grandiose and certainly exaggerated and stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to present some evidence. I'd like to show to you, I present to you the entity. This is part of the entity. Uh, this is the part that is, uh, represents an individual episode in a TV show, uh, or a documentary, or an installment in a daily news. And we can zoom in. We do need to zoom in. So we have, what do we have? We have some program user data, we have media assets, we have index points in the stream, we have categories, we have Legal age, that's the rating. Uh, there, is, there are titles, live buffers, a uh, whole bunch of stuff brought together in this one entity. So it looks a bit like this. And all these are different perspectives on the TV show. And you can't really say that it's wrong because uh, you can sort of relate all of these things to a TV show. But at the same time, uh, it's not really helpful to look at a TV show this way. 
It's going to stay hard to reason about if you need to think about all these things every time you think about a TV show. So let's return to this question, what is a TV show? Uh, and the answer to that question depends on who's asking. And if you start thinking that way, you can uh, uh, try to do a functional decomposition. Maybe you don't have to think about everything at the same time, all the time. So we use this idea from uh, domain-driven design called bounded contexts to try to isolate different contexts that we can sort of view the TV show in. So if you try to do that, we can look at the TV show in the catalog context. It might look something like this. This is the TV series Zombie Lars, which is uh, about a kid zombie. Uh, and here you can say that we're concerned with stuff like, oh, it has three seasons, it has some extra material like a trailer, uh, it has different episodes. For the episodes, uh, you have uh, the rating, duration, stuff like that. And uh, basically, from that perspective, what you're dealing with is complexity with respect to metadata that's describing the media content. That sort of information that you need as a user to navigate it and to sort of discern if this is something you want to watch. And you might wonder inside that context, what kinds of TV shows are there? How should they be represented? What's their logic? Because we have lots of kinds of different kinds of TV shows. We have a TV series with episodes, we have the daily news, we have talk shows, we have documentaries. And you might want to differentiate how you consume those things. Like you might want to binge watch a TV series, you don't want to binge watch the daily news. A different kind of perspective is to look at a TV show in a playback context. So the playback context is concerned with this thing. It's like the media stream itself. So it's interesting how long it is, maybe uh, accessibility versions, stuff like that. Uh, so we have lots of different kinds of complexity uh, with respect to playing the actual media content. And you might have to worry about support for various kinds of media manifests. You might be concerned about streaming quality. You might be concerned about adapting the bitrate to the device you're uh, viewing on and to the network, because if you're watching on uh, big screen in your, t in your uh, living room, uh, you want max quality immediately. Whereas if you're using a, a smart, uh, smartphone on uh, yeah, 3G, uh, you might want a lower bitrate and then scale up uh, if the network is capable of handling that kind of traffic. And you might be uh, concerned about supporting accessibility versions and stuff like that. Okay, so that was two contexts. What about other contexts? So here we have an attempt, a simplified attempt to, to sort of break down different kinds of lenses that you can view the TV show from. And the reason we do that is to contain complexity. So we can sort of think about these things without thinking about everything at once. But it's not just about complexity. It's also about uh, exploiting that these different contexts had different goals and different requirements. What I mean by that is, for instance, what about criticality? How important is it that we are sort of full up and running in all these different kinds of contexts? Now, if you come to our service and you can't watch anything, then it's kind of useless. So this is highly critical. And this means that we probably want redundancy for this so that we ensure that we have a high uptime. You also have these sort of supporting things that help you find whatever you want to watch. That's kind of critical too. Whereas these other things like personalizations, your favorites, how far you watch your show and stuff like that, might be more optional. So perhaps they could go down. Perhaps you don't need that same kind of level of redundancy. But if you mix everything together, you have the same kind of uh, criticality for everything. So if you want redundancy, everything needs to be redundant. What about caching? Well, personalization is sort of notoriously not cacheable, uh, but if you mix it with everything else, well, also playback perhaps uh, with respect to choosing the correct CDN to deliver your media stream, uh, maybe that's not too cacheable either. But if you mix everything, then everything is non-cacheable as well. What about failures? Well, again, if you have a single service that serves up everything, if one of those optional things goes down, everything goes down. 
So when you have everything mixed together in a monolith, you have something that's uniformly crit uh, critical, not easily cacheable, hard to uh, achieve partial success, and it's prone to fail hard, and it's very hard to reason about, because you have to think about sort of the interactions between everything. So what to do about that? Well, there's a talk coming up right after this called the Deliberate Architecture, and I liked the title so much that I stole it for this slide. So we need some deliberate architecture to sort of move out of that situation. So what we did is that we, we started in sort of a, a socio-technical perspective, but we lobbied for and got ourselves an architect, someone who could sort of drive this deliberate architecture process to move us to a better place. And the role for that architect was not to come up with all the answers himself, but rather to ensure that the right questions were being asked at the right, right time. And we started thinking about these bounded contexts. We, uh, we tried to identify suitable bounded contexts and to treat those as potential service boundaries. And when we make new stuff, we create them as new services aligned with those bounded, con bounded contexts. A purely technical perspective is that we introduced a gateway uh, between sort of the clients and uh, our backend. So uh, Nginx and Wanish in front of the API, which acts as an architecture scheme that gives you sort of leeway to uh, route things uh, to different kinds of services. And with that in place, we can start using this thing called the strangler pattern. So you can sort of gradually, instead of replacing everything in one big operation, you can sort of gradually route some traffic to a, a new service and then uh, making the old service less relevant over time. And to support all this, we started experimenting with hypermedia. So we're coming back now finally to the hypermedia bit. And the purpose for hypermedia is to sort of recompose what we decompose. Because from the client's perspective, and also in particular from the user's perspective, this sort of decomposition is not helpful. They want an integrated experience, right? So they don't, don't want to have to think about, am I now in the playback context? Am I now in the catalog context? That's something for us to ponder and to sort of exploit for these uh, property, architectural properties that we want, but it's not something that the users sort of want to experience. So then, the introduction to hypermedia, what is this hypermedia thing? Well, very simply put, it's media with links. And those links have semantics. We sort of have. To, we often think about links as these URLs, right? So that's the addressable part. But it, they also have meaning, and for those meanings, they have link relations. It says something about how one resource re relates to another. And sort of an important thing is that link presence is not static. It's something that's dynamic, and it means something. So if you have a link present, that means that you can follow it. If it's not there, it means that you shouldn't try calling that endpoint. And links then turn these sort of static resources in more into junctions, like uh, ways where you can go in one direction or another depending on what you want to achieve. So links are affordances for the client. Links help answer this question, now what? So I've come so far, this far in your service, what should I do now? And therefore, there should be a link for every sort of option that the client should offer to the user to go forward. And if you do that, your resources will sort of stop being individual resources and connect to form more like a user narrative. I'm going to try to illustrate that with this. And what is this? This is a bunch of resources. And at this point, they're disconnected. So, uh, Sort of the client has no real guidance of how to navigate this picture. And if you add links, then it sort of becomes obvious how you can move through this thing that is now no longer just dots, but it's a directed graph. Uh, this is, I'm going to use sort of simplified pictures like this. In practice, often you'll have like embellishments with uh, simple resources like images and stuff like that. We're going to disregard that and draw simple graphs like this. And it's also important to note that this looks very static. In reality, it's more like potential links. 
So whether or not these links will actually be there depends on the state of your application or the state of your resource. So this is now, let's see uh, something, let's uh, assume that something interesting happens at this yellow point. That's sort of the end goal of your, 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 of your user narrative. So you're going to start down here, and then you have two options. You can go to the left or to the right. And say uh, the user chooses go to the left, then you have three more options, and maybe, maybe you go up there. But in this case, um, the state of this resource is such that it doesn't really make sense to go up there, so we drop that link, we don't present it to the client. There's no point for uh, the client to try to go there because, uh, because it's not going to make any sense. So now we have three links, and maybe the user goes up there and achieves the goal, which might be something like playing a video. Now, of course, there are, there are different kinds of paths through this graph. So last time we went to the left, we could go to the right instead. Then we could go there. We could take this detour around here. And we achieve the goal again through a different kind of path. So we can offer these alternative paths through the same graph for different variations of the same narrative or achieving the same goal. Um, yeah. OK, so we accomplished the goal again. What does this mean for the architecture? Well, it means that there is something, sort of, if your goal is to reach the yellow resource, you have now sort of a redundancy here. You can choose between those two. What does that mean? It means that if I go up here, and maybe something bad happens to this resource, maybe it goes down, maybe it comes to respond for whatever reason, I might still try to go there, but then I'm going to sort of end up in an error situation, and I can no longer reach the one up there. But as a client, I can still offer another kind of navigation, right? I don't have to give up. So I can go there instead. I can try going there. Is this going to work OK? Yeah, it works. Now I can still reach my goal. So even though in face of uh, partial failure, I can still watch TV or whatever. Right. OK, so we have this. It fits now nicely with sort of an image of the criticality of the different resources, right? So you do need, if you want to reach the one at the top, you do need those two, and you need one of those two, whereas the green ones you don't really need. It might be nice to have them there, but they're not critical. Now, I've been talking so far about resources. Uh, but this thing, this is sort of an abstract graph. So you could think, this is a smaller graph now, uh, you could uh, employ, uh, employ sort of the same kind of thinking, but at a larger kind of granular, granularity, like uh, for your bounded contexts. So if you now imagine that we have these four contexts. I can navigate uh, between them. They might be composed by different kinds of resources in different kinds of ways. Uh, but we don't have to think about that all the time. So sort of from an abstract view, I can think about this, what kinds of ways do I have to navigate between my contexts? And then inside those, I might be concerned about details of how we accomplish the goal in each context. Now, this becomes relevant. Let's see. This becomes relevant uh, for evolution. Right, when we talk about how to evolve a service, we all, uh, often concern ourselves with uh, versioning of APIs. Right? How do I version this API? And a classical uh, question to ask is how should, what kind of versioning scheme should I use? Should I be versioning in the URL, or should I be using content negotiation, or, or what kind of approach should I use? And sort of our experience has been that it's less relevant than you might think, because we don't, we don't so often need to sort of replace one by one, uh, one single uh, resource with another. What we'd like to do instead is to offer sort of a new and improved kind of narrative. So we don't replace at the individual resource level, more like at the context level. And then we could use links to offer these new kinds of alternatives to clients. We can identify these narrative with these link relations that will look more into later. 
and then we can let the client sort of opt into these new alternatives when they're ready. So they don't have to do this at, synchronized at the same time. All clients switch to this now. Uh, they can choose to opt in based on their capabilities. And maybe some clients never opt in, right? Because it's, uh, it doesn't make sense from a business perspective. We can track which clients use which narratives to achieve which goals. Uh, we have the client self-identify through the user agent header, so we sort of know what resources they hit, what services they hit. And then we can optionally eventually remove links to those obsolete narratives. So um, as an example of that, let's see we have these four contexts now. We have up to the left our catalog. And maybe we figure out that this is now, OK, this is not the optimal way to navigate our catalog, so we'd like to replace that with something else. So this is now our legacy catalog. Now, how should we do that? And we have three ways to reach this context from other contexts. We have uh, the series relation from personalization and desking, and we have the episode relation from, from the play, uh, playback context. Now, we want to replace that with sort of a more sophisticated, nicer in every way uh, TV show page thing. How should we do that? Now, we want to sort of introduce now uh, ways to navigate to the same, to the same, uh, to alter the alternative uh, narrative. It sort of serves roughly the same purpose, uh, but in a different way. Now, initially, no one's using this new narrative, right? But we can gradually, perhaps, like uh, one of these progressive clients can have a feature flag or whatever to sort of start using this new narrative. And then gradually, over time, you can route more traffic to the new narrative. More clients can get aboard. And then you can sort of ramp up your new narrative, tone down the old one, and you might uh, stay for a while in something like this, right? You might have these legacy uh, clients that are not really uh, uh, capable of moving that fast, and they can stay supported like that for quite a long time. And then you can perhaps scale down the resources that you assign to that legacy catalog, and then you sort of the main effort it put into the new narrative. Okay. So, and at that point, perhaps eventually you can sort of drop the old narrative entirely. OK, so hypermedia, uh, let's sort of try to get more concrete. So the hypermedia format that we've been using at, uh, starting to use at NRK TV is called HAL. It uh, stands for Hypermedia Application Language. And it's a way to extend JSON documents with links and relations, basically. So why HAL? Uh, we use HAL because it's very lightweight, and it's easy to sort of introduce it gradually. So you don't have sort of, it's not intrusive uh, in any way, and you can retrofit uh, ordinary JSON documents with links using HAL without having to change uh, basically anything. You can just add the links, and it's going to be a valid HAL document. So we can do it gradually, which is nice. Um, in HAL, resources have links and they have state. And state is this sort of old JSON payload, whatever. And then they have the links. Uh, and then you have sort of a specification for how you add links to that. Those links have this target, uh, the URL, and they have the relation that describes sort of the meaning of navigating through that, uh, to that URL. And in addition, I'm going to show uh, resources may have uh, embedded resources in them. And that's something that you might want to do if you have uh, one resource that is associated with a collection of other resources, and you want some representation of those other resources embedded in, in your resource. It becomes easier to understand this with a few examples, I hope. Uh, so this is a very simple HAL document. It has just the links element, no state. So you have the collection of links. It looks like this. So if you have links, it should be in this property, underscore links. Then you have the link relation, which says, OK, this link that, goes, uh, that comes later on here, what does it mean from the perspective of the resource I'm at? And then you have the target, which is uh, identified by the href and the URL to reach that target. So if you navigate to this, you're going to basically navigate back to this same self uh, resource in this case. Uh, different example, again, the collection of links. Here you have more links. So you have the self link, and you also have 
uh, a manifest relation. And then in that case, you have two options, so two links with the same relation. And then you can use this thing called a name in the health specification to differentiate, to choose between which one of those you want to use. In this case, it's for accessibility reasons. So we have a default man media manifest, and then you have uh, a manifest that has adaptions for um, viewers with reduced eyesight. Again, collection of links. Uh, two kinds of links here, self again and progress just to show that in HAL you can also have templated uh, URLs. And these embedded resources. In this case, we have a favorite, which is also a link, a link relation, and it's something that you can navigate to, but you want to embed that sometimes to sort of uh, uh, allow, for instance, um, someone to choose one of these embedded options for navigating further. Okay, so uh, more concrete examples from tvnrk.no. So uh, basically navigating the player API from the perspective of our web client. So what you typically do is that you start in the desking context, something like this, and you present now some, some different kinds of options. And this will be backed now by embedded uh, series resources. Um, to present options to the user. So it's going to be a series uh, for the, um, yeah, that's going to be the embedded resource. And then that's, uh, for each series, we're going to present some links. And this now uh, offers uh, the ability to navigate from the desking context to the catalog context through this link. So if you press this uh, in your browser, if you click this image, you're going to navigate over to the catalog context. Yes, um, in the catalog context, things look like this. We've seen something similar like this before. And this, again, is backed uh, with these uh, HAL documents with links. So for each episode in this TV series, we're going to have these uh, uh, options for navigation. So we sh uh, should be able to navigate to the playback context if you want to view this particular episode. Uh, we might offer uh, a legacy playback option as well, because we've, we've introduced a new um, implementation for the playback service, but not all clients have moved to that yet, so they're still using the old one. And then we offer a share link as well, if you want to sort of uh, share this, um, this particular episode with one of your friends. Uh, in this context, or in this situation, we want to navigate to the, uh, further to the playback context just as we did in the example with the graphs. So here we have the playback context. And again, it's backed by this HAL document with options for where or what you want to do next. Right? So uh, what you probably want to do is, um, if you want to uh, watch this particular episode, is to resolve the actual manifest URL. And that's, that's typically not uh, very cacheable, so we want to uh, make that as small uh, as possible. Um, so you resolve the manifest URL just in time when you click play. Um, we also have, since uh, in the cases where we have accessibility versions for the same program, we uh, use these links to power this dialog over here. So we present this dialog with options for accessibility if there are links present uh, so uh, that the user can choose what kind of version uh, they want to, to see. And then um, when you're done watching an episode, maybe you want to watch the next one. So we offer that as well through this uh, next relation. So it's, then we stay in the playback context and keep playing. And you could optionally also go back to the catalog context and uh, sort of look at uh, the TV series as such. And finally, uh, the last thing that the client might want to do at this, uh, when playing this is to report the progress, how far you've seen this, uh, so that you can continue watching it, perhaps on another device. OK. So um, with that, let's take a look at where we are today. Well, it's 2019. Uh, I'm happy to report that the monolith is shrinking. 
We've deleted, I suppose, something like uh, a third of the source code for the monolith. And uh, it sort of keeps shrinking. Uh, it happens like uh, in, in irregular intervals. Uh, but it becomes more wieldy uh, every time we delete more code. Uh, so it's, it's less scary now. Um, and we don't have to touch it that often. So that's good. We no longer have and no longer rely on this uh, genius release manager, which is also good. Uh, mostly, we run independent deploys. So teams don't re really need to coordinate when they uh, deploy. So if you want to deploy daily, you can do that. That uh, usually causes no problems. Uh, instead of uh, cunning caching schemes, we rely much more heavily on plain old HTTP uh, caching. So per resource, uh, or typically driven then by uh, the concerns for a given bounded context, we can set various kinds of uh, HTTP headers, uh, which is sort of appropriate to the kind of caching for that context. All new resources use these HAL links to sort of connect. And um, since HAL is sort of backwards, compa uh, backwards compatible with uh, plain old JSON, uh, we have also retrofitted uh, some old resources with links as well to sort of tie in these new narratives with the old ones. And then with support for hy uh, from Hypermedia, um, we have been able to phase in some new services or new implementations replacing uh, old services. Uh, we've watched, um, um, well, sort of hinted at uh, that we've uh, replaced the playback context. We've also introduced this uh, TV show pages. It's not, uh, we haven't moved everyone over yet, but we're sort of in the progress. And um, we have launched a brand new personalization service as well. Um, that's been implemented on an entirely different stack. Uh, it's using, um, F, it's written in F-sharp, it runs on uh, Microsoft Orleans uh, on Kubernetes in Azure, so it's pretty cool. Pretty happy about that. And if you want to hear more about that, you can catch uh, Huddle's talk uh, tomorrow uh, at 3 o'clock. Uh, that should be an interesting talk. And of course, we continue to evolve, um, not just in terms of architecture or in terms of services, uh, but uh, I mean, the business, the domain is continuing to, to evolve. Uh, our organization is continuing to evolve. And uh, the architecture sort of tries to follow along. And, uh, well, obviously, architecture is never done. Um, but I, I think this talk is. And, well, I think we're ending quite early, so we have plenty of time for questions. Thank you. So, any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, um, so the question was, uh, how dynamic are the clients themselves with respect to using these links? So uh, I'll say that it has been a transition uh, because, like, uh, when we started introducing these links, uh, clients were um, were constructing these links themselves, right? Combining IDs and stuff like that, and uh, and calling the right endpoint. Um, so it, it has been a, a transition to uh, explain uh, how uh, the, um, what the intent is of introducing these links and uh, to sort of make clients confident that the options that we present as links are going to be sufficient. Um, of course, there are many kinds of clients. Uh, I haven't seen all the client code, so I, I don't really know how much, uh, how truly dynamic they are and how much has been hard-coded. Uh, so uh, we need a client developer to sort of uh, tell you the truth about that. So my impression is that they're actually using these links, um, but how, do, uh, how dynamic uh, they are like in general, I don't really know, or I, I can tell for sure. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, how, how we, uh, yeah, the question is how do we inform the clients how to use the links? Yeah, 
Right, yes. So what we do is, um, well, uh, it's easier for the clients that are co-located with us. So then we can sort of uh, talk about this daily, right? Uh, and we can sort of evolve the API correspondingly. Um, in addition to that, we use um, it's formerly known as Swagger uh, Open API to document this. Um, that's a different kind of talk that I would like someone to do one day, is to, uh, to talk more about uh, how to use Open API properly. What we often use is uh, sort of reverse engineering using Swashbuckle, and the results are not always great. Uh, and in particular for uh, something that's meant to be dynamic, like the links, uh, because you want to explain sort of when can I rely on this link being here and when it's not going to be here. Uh, so we try our best. Uh, we handwrite our contracts uh, in Swagger or OpenAPI uh, to pr provide as good documentation as possible. But of course, the best thing is to be able to talk to, to the clients themselves. We try to do that. Uh, but yeah. Any other questions? If not, I think we'll go for coffee. Thank you. <laughs>